Today's message um, is titled, Not Always the Dog. And I title it this because last week I preached Jesus and the dog from Jesus' trip into Tyre and Sidon when he meets a woman whom his people commonly referred to as dogs. And I, I walked you through the Old Testament usage of that word. And his disciples seemed pretty put off by this woman, this Gentile woman's request. And Jesus looks past her group identity and looks at her. He looks past the fact that she's referred to as a dog and he speaks directly to her as a human. And when he does, he gives her everything she wants, but he doesn't do it because she's living right or she's done good things or she's a good deed doer, but her faith. He says, your faith has given you everything you're looking for, which is the key to everything we are. Believe on Jesus and accept him as the giver, not me as the doer. And I can do, but I'll do it out of who I am, not to be who I wish I could be. And that's the great story of Jesus and the dog, is that Jesus takes all of us who are often on the outside, we're on the margin, we, we've messed up, we've ruined it. Um, someone today in, in prayer said, we don't deserve it. That's the way, that's Christian talk. And that's human talk. And that's the way we ought to talk, is we don't deserve this grace this love, I can't earn it, I can't pay for it. In that respect, we are all the dog. We are all at the end of the line. We are all undeserving. We're all sort of outside the, 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 the proper place. And then we come to Jesus and Jesus loves all of us dogs. Jesus takes care of us. Jesus, the great Joshua with all of us Caleb's, take us into the promised land. And that's the beauty of that journey. But that's not the whole story. Um, it's a great story. I, I think it's a great word. I think it helps all of us who've ever felt like we're not very good, uh, who, who don't feel like we're much. Uh, and if you've, we've all been there. And if you haven't, um, I'm shocked because the world will knock you down and, uh, and humble you. And so when you don't feel like you're much, you have all of it in Christ, but that's not your entire identity. We don't want to walk around every moment of every day as the dog because we're not just the outsider. We have a king as our father. We are sons and daughters of God. We're members of the family. We have an identity. Now, I think what happens is that we tend to speak like this. I'll give you a statement and then I'm going to qualify it. Okay. We say things like, what you see right now is not your true identity. You have, a, you have a true identity, so you need to live out of your true identity. But when we say that, what that denotes is there's a false identity. And so what that would mean then is that there's a true you and a fake you. And I don't think we're doing anyone any favors when doing that. I don't think that our best approach with grace is to say to people, well, there's a real you and a false you because that denies the part of you that you know is real and tries to make it feel like it's fake. No, it's not fake. It's really you. You are flawed. There's a real you that has some problems and some issues. And we don't have to spiritualize it and act like it's the fake you, but the real you is one of the sons of God. How about this? How about you are a human being with problems who's also a partaker of the divine nature, as Peter said. You partake in the divine nature. He is in you and he's real and you're also real. And the you that's sitting in this room is also in the great mystery seated with Christ. And those two things are happening at the exact same time. It's, it's like saying... Um, I have a human nature. I'm, I'm a human being. I have a divine nature. I'm part of the divine. Um, it's also, we, we can say both things and they can be true at the same time. Let me give you an example. We need to empty ourselves. We are just an empty vessel. Empty ourselves of self. And if we seek to save our life, we lose it. So just empty yourself of self. That's a true statement. We are full of the goodness and grace of God. Well, which are we, Pastor? Are we empty or are we full? Both at the same time. I mean, we are emptying ourselves of, of 
what's in the way. That's tearing that rope down till it's a thread that we, we preached a couple weeks ago. But we're also full of the goodness of God and full of the love of God and full of the grace of God. Empty and full at the same time? Yes, of course. Of course we are. And the ability to see that is part of our maturity. Well, here's another one. And man, this one really fires some people up. That we are both a sinner and a saint. That one fires people up because, and it used to fire me up really. When I first started preaching grace, I went on a rampage against people saying, we are sinners saved by grace. And I would go, you are not a sinner, you are a saint. I've refined it a little bit. I'm not real excited about the following statement. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm okay with, if you'll drop the just. If you say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, I go, eh, you're more than just a sinner saved by grace. You are, you're a son of God. You're a saint. You are what the Bible says you are. But I don't get so crazy mad about I'm a, I'm a sinner saved by grace because in reality, I know that I have some problems and a lot of them. And I know that it's grace that is why I am what I am. So I don't want to get lost in terminology. And sometimes we get so fired up when we hear a phrase and it doesn't line up with the way we think theology works and we quit listening to the whole sermon. So I, I'm really doing this today to show you that we can be just like the Syrophoenician woman. We can be with the knowledge that, look, I'm an outsider. I don't deserve you, but I, I believe you could touch me anyway. And he goes, yes, I can. And you walk through life with a little bit of a dog idea of knowing that you don't deserve anything. And yet Jesus loves you. But at the same time, simultaneous to that, flip the coin. You're not a dog. You're one of the sons of God and you need to know the difference and you need to be able to embrace those two things as happening at the same time. Remember this woman's, the, the world around her viewed her one way. Jesus saw her as worthy in spite of herself. Jesus doesn't fight against what people are calling her. He doesn't say, oh, I don't believe him. He just loves her anyway. All right. And the, the ability to find our identity then is up to us. So that even when we're rejected or we're ignored, we know that Christ will walk us into the promised land. So I'm going to show you two sides of the same coin today. Let's start in Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. I want to read for you two verses from a passage that's really in regards to the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly temple. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 Actually, let's do 13 because I don't like the middle of the sentence stuff. So I'll, let's go top of the sentence in verse 13. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Here's really our concentration is the next two verses. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, that's the cross, how much more would he cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's a good question. The blood of Jesus ought to cleanse your conscience from trying to do good to get good. If you accepted what Christ did, you could be relieved from the do good, get good mentality. Why has the church not been relieved from the do good, get good mentality? Because I think it's because we're not seeing that Christ has done the good so that we can receive the good. Okay, that's my answer to that question and now let's read 15 for this reason he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance look at that you and i are the called and we get a eternal inheritance okay all that believe on jesus receive the fullness of the new covenant. We have the promise of the eternal inheritance. That is my identity in Christ. I'm one of the sons of God. I get the full inheritance because Christ has redeemed me from doing good to get good. I am what he says I am. Flip the coin. First Timothy chapter one. So just backtrack in your Bibles just a little bit, a couple of books previous to Paul's letter to young Timothy. Paul is dying. He's in prison. He's not dying from any malady. He's, his ministry's coming to an end and he's about to die at the chopping block as a martyr for the cause of Christ. And he writes a couple of letters to young Timothy. 
some spectacular Christian instruction. And right here near the end of his life, Paul says something we don't hear him saying when he's younger, when he's in his brash, fired up, changing the world version. I've been in brash, young, changing the world version. I liked him. I don't want to stay him forever, but you know, he had his moment in the sun. Brash, young, changing the world version. But then there's another version that says this in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I want to pause for a moment. I want you to see what Paul just did. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul goes, I'm the chiefest of sinners. It doesn't sound like the kind of thing that younger Paul would have said. Paul that writes the Galatians and the Ephesians and the Romans. He's always talking about who he is in Christ. But here near his end, he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm the chief. I've learned some things about myself. I am the chief of sinners. I, know, I told you this was two sides of the same coin, right? I have an eternal inheritance. He's a mediator of a new covenant. I get it all because of the blood of Jesus. I don't have to do good to get good. I just get it because he's a good God. And he loves dogs a lot. Like me? Flip the coin. Yeah. Like me. Chiefest of sinners. But what's the point in us calling ourselves a sinner if we know that we're also a saint? That's verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Look at that. By identifying myself as the chief of sinners, I become a pattern for everyone who's going to get saved. That's the way we would say it. For all the people I come in contact with who don't know my Jesus, if I can still know that I am the chief of sinners, it gives hope to all of those sinners. Paul's way of saying, if I only identified myself on the other side of the coin, I couldn't identify myself with any sinner. I could only see myself as the righteousness of God, one of the sons of God. What do I have to offer other than to try to change people? But if I could still see myself as the chief of sinner, I become a pattern to everyone I come in contact who might become a believer. Because if I know I'm still a chief of sinners, then I still need God's grace. That changes the way I present the gospel. I think this is a powerful way of saying it's important that I realize the, the new covenant is mine on this hand and I get all of it and I have all of it. But on this hand, if I'm going to effectively live this out in a world full of sinners, it really helps if I can see myself still as the chief of sinners who has found Jesus and Jesus has found me. I'm the dog, but I'm not always the dog. Like, I know I don't deserve it, but I know it's mine, and I get it whether I deserve it or not. And if I forgot that I'm this, I might be no good to anybody that's over here. And I've seen a lot of Christians become only recognizing what they're going to and who they are so they can no longer identify with a sinner. They no longer have anything to say other than you need to change. You need to get saved. You need to find God. And it becomes so distant and harsh and stone throwing from the other side of what I know I have. But I've also seen us as believers so conscious of just being the dog. that We don't have any peace in what belongs to us. So we're just always downtrodden and we're going to hell and I just hope I get to heaven when I die. And I, what should I do to please God that's mad at me? And we can be so mind, sin minded that we don't realize what is ours. So I actually believe in balance. People talk about in grace, they go, well, you can't balance grace. No, you can't balance grace. God doesn't need grace balanced. Everybody needs grace. God pours his grace out on whoever he wants to. It's his grace, it's not my grace. But I do believe in the balance of me knowing that I am both. And we need that because we become a house then where the sinners go to church. What good would that do us? Because if we're the house where the sinners go to church, sinners could find hope if they came. But we're also the house where the saints meet. 
The sons and the daughters of God get together and they talk about their week and they talk about their hopes and their dreams and their sin and their failures and their sicknesses and their needs because they're still living in a world that's downtrodden, but they're also the sons and daughters of God. So we're not, always, we're not only one thing, we are also something else. And if we can catch that identity, it'll make a difference in the way that we live and the way that we walk. All right, let me run into the weeds with you for a moment, tell you a story. Okay. Um, this is one that you're familiar with, and I, I want to try to read minimally. And with that said, we're going to read a chunk in a moment from the Old Testament, but I got a lot I was going to read. And I thought, well, don't, don't wear them out with reading. So let me just tell you the story, and then we'll read a little bit of it, okay? In the Old Testament, the first king that Israel has is a man named Saul. And if you're new to the Bible, don't be confused. There's a Saul in the Old Testament, and there's a Saul in the New Testament. They're not the same person, okay? A little confusing, but that's the way it is. Saul is the first king of Israel in the Old Testament. He was chosen because he was the tallest. Good qualifications, right? I mean, there was more to it than that, but I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. And the Cliff Notes version is he was taller than everybody else in the room and people thought tall people had something special going on in that era. And so he was the man who was chosen. Saul's chosen to be king and from the get-go, um, there are problems. And part of the problem is that Israel only wanted a king because ultimately they were rejecting the kingship of God. And they even told God, we want to be like the other nations. They all have kings. We want to have kings. And so Israel gets himself a king. And the biblical story is leading us to the king of kings. All right. But there's types and shadows on the way there. And there's a young man keeping sheep on the backside of his father's ranch named David, who will become the king by which the kings of Israel are modeled. Well, David doesn't have any rights to the throne. David's just a kid who's a shepherd who happens to be um, anointed and chosen by God to be the next king, which is a problem in the king's house because the king has a son named Jonathan. And king's sons are also called princes. And Prince Jonathan, by blood rights and the divine right of kings, should be the next king of Israel. But Jonathan is a discerning young man. And he recognizes that the hand of God to be king is not on him. But he has a buddy named David whom he sees the hand of God is upon. David kills Goliath, is the champion of Israel. He's this incredibly anointed and talented young man who comes from nowhere and I, I'm, 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 man, I'm giving you the brief version of this story, but trying to bring you right up to, the, to, to where we need to be. And, and jo Jonathan and David develop a friendship. Jonathan is discerning enough to know that he shouldn't be king. And he's also discerning enough to know that David should be. He can sense it and he knows God's presence is on David's life. David is humble enough to not claim any acceptance of the kingship or acceptance to the throne, but discerning enough to know that God's chosen him to do something. And so him and Jonathan strike up a friendship. And the Bible says that they one day cut a covenant. And a covenant means that you and I enter into an agreement by which if I break it, I die. If you break it, you die or are divinely cursed. So it was a pretty big deal in their mentality and their religion to develop a covenant. Such a big deal that covenant talk gets brought over into the New Testament. In Galatians, I just taught this last week in our Galatians series. In Galatians 3, Paul goes, I speak in the manner of men. Let's do this through the terms of covenant. Okay, God doesn't need one, but we do. Okay, and so covenant is like, I make a promise, you make a promise. I'll do my end of the deal. You keep your end of the deal. And the deal was, Jonathan says to David, my dad doesn't like you. My dad wants to kill you. He knows you're a threat to the throne. He thinks I ought to be king. I disagree. I know you're God's man. Here's what I'll do for you. When my dad gets hot and mad and angry and is ready to come after you, I'll give you a heads up. I'll always be one step ahead of pops. When he speaks in the chamber, no one knows what he's going to do but me because I'm in the inner chamber because I'm the next king. When he speaks his anger and his vitriol and his hatred, I'll give you a warning. Get out of town. All you got to do for me, I'm not going to make it through this. I'm going to die and you're going to be the next king. And all you got to do for me is take care of my kids and my grandkids. Make sure they always have. And they cut a covenant and they shake on it. And that's the story. And Jonathan keeps his end of the deal. 
When Saul gets hot, wants to kill young David because he's hearing songs sang in the streets. Saul has killed his, killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul gets angry and he gets jealous and he decides to go attack David. And Jonathan always gives him a warning. David stays a step ahead of Saul and Saul can't figure it out. It's a pretty fascinating story in the Old Testament. He's always a step ahead. There's always this little espionage of Jonathan always sending a message to David. And David always one step ahead. of the, and, and quite an exciting story. And when it all comes down, David and Jonathan are killed in battle. Uh, or, I'm sorry. Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. David remains and, of course, is going to become the next king. And there's chaos in the house of Saul because both the king and the prince have died. And who's supposed to be next? Well, that would be one of Jonathan's kids. And Jonathan's kid is a young kid by the name of Meribah, destroyer of Baal. Great big prophecy over his life when he's born. Meribah is going to destroy the idols of the Philistines. And whenever they hear that Saul and Jonathan have died, Meribah's nurse grabs him up to run him out of the house and she trips and drops little five-year-old Meribah and it breaks his legs. And when they reset them, they don't reset them properly and Meribah is raised lame. He can't walk properly. As the grandson of the king... And the son of the prince, he's the rightful next king. However, the maid picks him up and runs because her mentality is, since Saul's dead and Jonathan's dead, David's a danger. I've been hearing about this bad guy, David. David's going to come in here and kill us all. And in her haste, she breaks the young boy's legs while trying to save his life. And the moral of the story is that she doesn't know that David and Jonathan had a covenant. And that David and Jonathan's covenant was that David had to be good to little Maribel. But the maid doesn't know that David has to be good to little Maribel because she has no knowledge of covenant. And what you don't know hurts you. And what you don't know hurts your kids. And what we don't know in the church is killing a generation. We've made lame a generation on works preaching. They don't have any ability to follow the, the work of the Spirit because all we've done is put rules and regulations in front of them. And they don't know how to listen to the Holy Spirit because all we've given them is rules. And they don't know how to walk in the newness of life because all we've given them is being shuttled around by religion. And we've even changed their name from Slayer of Baal to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, that's a name you might have heard in your life. Mephibosheth is the same guy as Maribel, but Maribel's a kid with potential and he's going to knock down Baal and after his legs are broken, they start to call him Mephibosheth, which is disgrace and shame. Now try living with that over your head. The grandson of a dead king who should have been king, whose legs don't work properly, who've never heard a good word in his life about David. David's the bad guy. David's the one who took your dad's throne and your granddad's throne. Stay away from David. David's out to get you. I'll meet you in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want to show you the moment when David remembers covenant. He cuts a covenant with Jonathan. Jonathan is long dead. David has taken the throne. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, I don't know what translation of the Bible that you're using, but I know that the word kindness from the Hebrew is the phrase covenant faithfulness. So let me read it to you that way. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him covenant faithfulness for Jonathan's sake? Hear that phrase, for Jonathan's sake. What's that mean? I'm not doing it because I like the, whoever he or she is. I don't even know if there's anyone left. But is there anyone left that I could be good to because I cut a covenant with Jonathan? And I want to keep my end of the deal to my old friend. I'm the king and I'm partially king because Jonathan kept his deal. He kept telling me when dad, his dad was mad at me. And I always outran the fox. And here I am. And I want to pay him back. And I want to do it because I loved Jonathan. Is there anybody left? 
Verse 2, and there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they called that servant to David, the king said, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. And the king said, is there not still someone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Okay, there's our, there's our little cripple boy. We even know how he was made lame because we've heard that story. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Makir, the son of Emil, and Lodebar. Lodebar is the Hebrew phrase for desert place. He's just living in the middle of nowhere. And if you're living in a desert, you're not eating well either. And you're on the run. Mephibosheth has tried to stay away from deadly King David his entire life, even to the point of living in a desert place. And King David sent and brought him out of the house of Makir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I want to pause. Why am I being kind to you? For Jonathan's sake, right? You have nothing to do with it, Mephibosheth. I'm being good to you for Jonathan's sake. I keep repeating this for a reason. This is covenant language. It's isn't about you earning it. It's isn't about you feeling worthy. It's isn't about you deserving it. Wouldn't matter if you did. I'm not being good to you for you. I didn't even know you existed till about 20 seconds ago. I called you here because I loved your dad. And your dad and I had a covenant. And I'm going to be good to somebody today that's related to your dad. It might as well be you. Okay, now we're all up to speed. I'm going to, middle of the verse. I'm going to restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you're going to eat bread at my table continually. This guy's been living in the desert on the run with no farm of his own. He's probably mostly starved. And he just had his grandfather's property restored to him and a daily stipend at the king's table. This is the greatest day of Mephibosheth's rather miserable life. And he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Okay, now you know why we're in the weeds, don't you? We got ourselves another dog. <laughs> I hadn't forgot about our Syrophoenician woman. I hadn't forgot about my intro. Here's another, here's the Old Testament version of the dog. Why would you look upon such a dead dog as I? I know I am but a sinner. Here we are on this side of the coin. I know I don't deserve this. What in the world are you taking time out of your kingly schedule to mess with a lame kid like me? And I want you to note Verse 9, the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given you your master's son, all that belonged to Saul, and all of his house. Pause. He doesn't say, get up, you're not a dead dog. No, he is a dog. That identity works right now. This is how we approach the king. We come with nothing, man. We come dead dog as I. It's okay. But remember, you're not always the dog. Keep that... That's where we're going. We're in the weeds, but we're going to, you're not always a dog, okay? So watch how Mephibosheth's life begins to change. 10, you and your sons and your servants are going to work the land for this guy, and you're going to bring in the harvest so that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall always eat bread at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's 36 people who are going to spend their lives now waiting on a kid who as of this morning had nothing, and now he has everything. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Oh, he was a dog, but I'm going to let him eat like a son. Okay. Here's our two coins coming together. He's a dog that doesn't deserve it. He woke up not deserving it, but I got a covenant. And for Jonathan's sake, he's better than he thinks he is. And he's going to get to eat like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. Look at 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continuously at the king's table. But he was still lame in both his feet. He still got the dead dog. 
He still can't walk like he needs to. And this for me is an indication that not everything gets fixed when you get into covenant. Okay? Because it's easy to get all excited in Christianity and get up and tell people, come to Jesus and he'll take away all your problems. Come to Jesus and he'll fix all that stuff. And the reality is, is that Jesus didn't promise to fix everything and make it perfect like you think is perfect. Jesus promised you to give you life and to give it to you more abundant. And we all come to Christ and we still got stuff in our lives that doesn't work the way we thought it should. And the covenant promises that we get to eat at the king's table. I'm going to take care of you. Bring your lameness and sit at the table. It's okay. Lame, I, I, I want to slow down, make sure we get to, lame people don't get an audience with the king. When Jesus came to heal the poor, the halt, the maim, and the blind, he was picking the people that don't get to eat at parties. When he told stories about how they filled the, the house with their friends and their friends wouldn't come because they had to go look at a piece of property or go uh, try out the oxen I bought. And he went, go out into the highways and the hedges and bring the poor and the halt and the lame and the blind and bid them to come to my supper. That was path-breaking stuff. Those kind of people don't get to eat at the wedding supper. And Jesus is going, they do at mine. That's the kind of party I'm throwing. And that's Mephibosheth talk. That's bring in people that can't get in on their own. They can't walk. And set them down at the table and let the king feed them. Let the king bless them. Mephibosheth sees himself as a dead dog because his kind don't eat at king's tables. But just like Jesus going to Tyre and Sidon and talking to the dog, when it comes to the individual, God looks past groups like lame people and his enemies and loves individuals. We collectively put people into groups so we can ignore it. So we don't have to deal with the individual because they're part of those weirdos until we cross the weirdo, the weird one. It's okay if they're weirdos, OS, but when it becomes the weird one, we have to deal with them. And there stands or sits the Mephibosheths of the world. And so there's the dog. And as the story continues, let me step away from reading for a moment to pick the story up. David has a son named Absalom. And Absalom is a, the Bible describes him as, the Old Testament's really big on height and looks. Absalom's tall and he's better looking than all of his fellow. It must have been an ugly world. They were so excited about <laughs> They're so excited about somebody being good looking. Absalom's good looking. And because of it, everybody likes him in the old world. And they like to hear him talk. And they like to hear him tell stories. And I think they kind of like it that he's the king's kid. And Absalom takes it upon himself to become the next king, even though dad's still alive. This is a problem, right? This is the prodigal son going, dad, give me my inheritance. And I taught you, what, what does the dad have to do in order for you to get your inheritance? He has to die. So Absalom wants to be king. The problem is David's still alive. And so Absalom comes up with an idea where he starts an insurrection and essentially a rebellion against his father. He builds a small army to run into Jerusalem against his father. And his father, rather than fight his own son, his father packs his bags and leaves. He turns the other cheek before Absalom can even hit it. And David runs out into the countryside and lets Absalom have the city. And in a moment of graphic description that I won't go into, it describes some of the things that Absalom does in his father's house and to his father's house and in his father's city. And the entire time, David loves this rebellious son. That's where we get the famous Absalom, Absalom, the repeating of his name. And Jesus does that as an ode as the son of David. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he goes, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. How often I've wept over you. It's Jesus replaying David's story of that which I love doesn't want anything to do with me. David loves Absalom and wants nothing to do with his father. And Jesus loves Jerusalem, which wants nothing to do with him, a new David. And on, G on David's journey out of Jerusalem, he's met with a cast of characters. And some of the characters are supportive of David. We believe in you, king. We're, not, we're on your side. 
And some of them are a little shifty. And some of them are taking advantage of the fact that David doesn't have the power base he used to have. And it's a real dramatic story. It'd make a really great series. And David comes across Ziba. Remember Ziba? Ziba is the servant who introduced him to Mephibosheth. Let's meet this cat. 2 Samuel. Chapter 16, verse 1. David was a little past the top of the mountain. And there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them were 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, What do you mean to do with these? And Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and the summer fruit for those for your young men to eat the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, where is your master's son? That's Mephibosheth, remember? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he stayed in Jerusalem because he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. And the king said to Ziba, here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you that I may find favor in your sight, my lord, O king. Uh-oh, tragedy. Let me explain what's just happened in case you missed it. Ziba said, these are yours. I brought you some fruit of the field. And David goes, well, where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba goes, eh, I got bad news. He decided that today's the day that he gets his kingship back. So he stayed in Jerusalem to support your son Absalom. But I came out here because I'm on your side. And David goes, okay, well, then you can have Mephibosheth's share. Now, the tragedy of this is that we don't get to hear from Mephibosheth right here. It seems like Mephibosheth sends these donkeys and fruit out to meet David because Mephibosheth's lame. Ziba's supposed to be doing his work for him. But when Ziba gets there, he steals it out from under Mephibosheth by telling David about Mephibosheth's actions and words. And David doesn't keep covenant. Instead, cuts him off. David's hurt. He's angry. He's scared. He's running for his life. The last thing he needs to deal with is this little legal squabble from Mephibosheth. Wouldn't it be nice if they could meet up again? And we have one more chance at redemption. 2 Samuel 19. <laughs> 2 Samuel 19, 24. Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. Oh, here we go. He hadn't cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until he returned in peace. This is a guy who has been depressed since David's been on the run. So it was when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king because your servant is lame. And he slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were dead men before my lord the king, yet you set your servant among those who eat at your table. Therefore, what right do I have still to cry out any more to the king? I pause. I want you to think about what Mephibosheth has said. What right do I have? This is dead dog talk, right? Remember, he's the dead dog. Guys, I want to remind you, you are not only the dead dog. There comes a time when you shed the dead dog talk and you jump over here to your covenant and you live in what's yours. All Mephibosheth needs to say in this moment is, for Jonathan's sake. What got this whole thing started? For Jonathan's sake, I'm going to be good to you. If Mephibosheth would have reminded David of Jonathan for Jonathan's sake. But instead, what right do I have? Ugh. So what does David do? The king said, why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said you and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said, rather just let him take it all. And as much as my Lord has come back in peace in his own house. This is one of the tragedies of the Old Testament. It belonged to Mephibosheth by covenant. And because he didn't know the power of the covenant, he let slip what belonged to him. And I think too many of us are living in dead dog mentality because we don't know 
that we have a covenant. It is okay to know that you're a dead dog when you approach him and to remain in that mentality of, look, I know that I am a sinner and I know that he is the, he is the savior of sinners and I know he can save sinners like you because he is saving a sinner like me. That's valuable, but it's deadly when it comes to laying down what belongs to you, the peace and the joy that comes to you in knowing the covenant belongs to you, resting in the midst of your storms and your trials that is your right. And to say to God, what right do I have is to go back and call yourself a dog when it's time to take your stand and know that the covenant belongs to you. Just imagine a world where instead of saying, what right do I have? Mephibosheth had said, Jonathan. Just reminded David one word, Jonathan. I think David would have paused and went, Jonathan, my old friend. Mephibosheth, you're right. I made a promise to Jonathan. Now, I want to bring it into you. Let's get out of the weeds, all right? We have a God who doesn't forget that we have a covenant. But we are a people who do. And I don't for a moment believe that God is withholding from you because your confession isn't proper or God isn't giving you his goodness because you haven't figured out the right scripture. But I do believe we're carrying a lot of unnecessary baggage because we think that God's goodness is waiting on our goodness. And we need to be reminded of one word and it's not Jonathan. Jesus. Paul says, uh, let's land here, Ephesians chapter 4. I want to show you one more verse. Let's bring it back to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And I'm going to read from the King James on this last line. Even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Ooh. Let's hear that again. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, and forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. What was the phrase in the Old Testament? Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show them kindness for Jonathan's sake? I don't want to be good to him because they're good. I just want to be good to him because I love Jonathan. Here's God saying to you. I forgive you for Jesus' sake. Now, why does God forgive us for Jesus' sake? Because the Christian theology says this. Jesus took into himself all sin and died so that he could resurrect as a new Adam. And if Jesus took all sin into him, then for Jesus' sake, you must be forgiven. Because if it was in Christ, how can it be in you? And if you walk around with a dead dog mentality, odds are you also walk around perpetually guilty and condemned because you don't know you're actually forgiven for Jesus' sake. So don't just live on this side of the coin. Know that it exists, but also know what belongs to you. I am forgiven for Jesus' sake. No, I'm not forgiven because I had a good week. I'm not blessed because I'm praying right, found the right translation, or joined the right church. For Jesus' sake. And that allows us to accept whoever walks into the door as the dog they are. In the midst of a room full of people who also know their dog-like ways but who are glad to introduce the dog to the covenant for Jesus' sake. That you too can have everything he promised for Jesus' sake, not for your sake. I think this might be the best news possible. In a summer full of really good news, to me this is really, really good news. <laughs> That when I know I've been a dog, 
I have a seat at the master's table. And that having a seat at the master's table doesn't mean the rest of my life goes perfect. Sometimes I'm lame on both my feet, but my Jesus loves me. And for Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake, we are who we are today. Soak that up for just a second, would you? Father, thank you that for Jesus' sake, we are not guilty. (laughs) We are forgiven We get to go out here this week and be kind and tenderhearted and forgive one another, not because people deserve it or they earn it or because they've stopped acting like a dog, because they probably haven't. But we get to be that for Jesus' sake. And we get to do that because for Jesus' sake, we are what we are. We are like the Syrophoenician woman. We know that sometimes we are outcast and downtrodden and we come to you and ask for the little crumbs that even the dogs eat. But you love the dog inside of the dogs. The group doesn't define who we are. And you love us. And you pour your mercy and your grace on us and we receive it. But God, Father, I pray, may we never be like that last moment we see Mephibosheth. May we never forget that it was always about covenant. I only had it good because of a covenant. I have it good, not because I do good, but because he's good. And respect your favor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.